Hi everyone, it's Tox from CritsHappen.com. Thanks for watching and welcome back. We're here with another critical preview where we take a game that's about to be on Kickstarter, put it through its paces, and let you know about our experiences while playing it. This isn't meant to be a full review with a crit, a hit, or a miss rating, but rather insight into an upcoming game that might be of interest to you or your gaming group. If you like this, you can check out the Kickstarter project page directly through links at the end of this video or below in the video description. But in the meantime, what are we looking at? Today, we're going to look at something that no matter what language you speak, where you live, or what your capabilities are as a gamer, is just fun. We're going to throw goblins at each other, hard and fast. Now, this game is called Ruckus. It is from Goblin Army Games. It's for two to four players. Plays in about 20 to 40 minutes, depending on how many people you have involved in the game. And involves four different factions of goblins. You're going to have the clerics, the fighters, the thieves, and the necromancers. And it's up to you and your opponents to choose your army carefully, draft their positions behind a secret shield, and then release the hounds, or in this case, release the little greenies, and have them fight each other to the death. You're going to gain victory points, you're going to gain advantages during the battle, you're going to have the option to fall forward and make your attack even tougher, but at the end of the game, whoever has amassed the most victory points is going to be the king of all the goblins. So come with me, grab your swords, grab your bows, grab your shields, and make sure you stay out of the chaos or jump knee deep into it. Let's get into the world of Ruckus. <laughs> So here you see everything that you get with Ruckus. You get four player screens, which we'll talk about how those get used in a second when we build our armies. You get some kicker cards, which are going to help you throughout the gameplay to gain those and make an impact in the game. You're also going to get victory cards, which is what the primary thing you're going to be fighting over the game in. The victory cards will also determine the number of rounds you play in the game and what it is you're actually fighting over. And then you have four factions of cards. You have the thieves, the necromancers, the clerics, and the fighters, and each one is designed to be very different. In addition, you have some victory point tokens, which don't necessarily just equal points. They will at the end of the game. However, throughout the gameplay, they have the opportunity to add to your attack or to add to your damage and also add to your health and your strength and things like that. You also get a really cool little first player token of this happy little goblin who's so happy to be on the field and then probably will die because some bad things are going to happen and chaos is going to ensue. And then you get a couple of wooden cubes that are used to both track the damage on units and also track activated abilities. Now, the idea of Ruckus is very simple. Each player is going to pick a faction. You're then going to build your army based on different types of setup rules, and you're going to then send your army into battle to deal damage to the other army and hopefully gain victory points and win the game. So let's show you real briefly in a two-player setup how that gets done. So here you see a two-player setup where one player, who's playing the Thieves, has already put out his army behind his the battle screen, and we have the camp set up. The camp consists of the kicker cards, an upgrade deck, which is a mixture of all the remaining cards that you haven't chosen for your armies. So in this case, one player is playing the Necromancers and one player is playing the Thieves. Therefore, there are both Necromancers and Thieves in that deck to potentially upgrade to, which means, yes, if you're the Thief player, you could gain access to some Necromancers, and if you're the Necromancer player, you could gain access to Thieves. Remember, these are goblins, chaos ensues. You then have the victory point cards. Now, in this case, we have five laid out. There are four in this stack with the top one face up, and then the main one showing us what we're fighting over. This one is the G1000, and it says when you win this card, you gain one VP token, so you would take one of these. Then it says when you draw this card, play it as a unit, and you'll notice that it has this little arrow and it has this health, which means that it's going to help you in battle as well. There's two main types of damage that some goblins do, or that the goblins will do, inside of Ruckus. The first is ranged, the second is going to be melee, and the melee is a little like POW kind of symbol, or, or that explosion symbol. Now, the way this works is I'm going to play through as the purple player, as the necromancer. I have to draw cards from my deck, so in this case I draw five, which is my maximum starting, and I have to start to look at my cards and determine what is the best layout. 
Now, the layouts in Ruckus are very simple. You have five cards that you can field onto the battlefield at maximum. There are going to be recruit abilities that could potentially bring more out, but in this case we're just going to talk about the basics of army setup. You have three imaginary rows in your army. A front row, a middle row, and a back row. You can only have three units in your front row, two units in your middle row, and one unit in your back row. So as you can see, while I would normally not see what my opponent has, as you can see in this case, he has three units in his front row and two units in his back row, or his middle row, and no units in his back row. That is a completely legal setup. I could not, however, do this, where I have two units in my back row and one unit in my front row. Now, maybe I decide that I wanna put three guys in my front row who are all gonna do melee damage, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second, and then one guy in my second and one guy in my back row. That is a perfectly legal setup. You do not have to have three, two, and one, but three, two, and one is the maximum of what you can set up. Now, once people have chosen what goblins to put in what row, that is when the chaos and the insanity ensues. Now, you will remove your screens and each player will see what the other player set up. Now let's talk a little bit about damage. We talked about melee damage and range damage. Range damage deals damage to the front row of an opponent's army no matter what row it is in. That means, for example, I have this card, Fever. He has one range damage. He would do that range damage to the front row of my opponent, whether he was in the front, the middle, or the back row. So having ranged in the second and third row helps you deal damage to other players' front rows. Now, melee can only happen from the front row to the front row. Now, I know immediately what you're thinking, because this is what I was thinking. Is it a case where you just pick who attacks who? No. And is it a case of you pick who defends against who? No. What happens is each player, after they have the ability to use activated abilities, which we'll talk about in a second as well, each player adds up the amount of damage they could do. In this case, I have three goblins in my front row that all have the capability of dealing damage to my opponent's front row. I would add up one, two, three, four possible damage to that front row. But in addition, I have Fever, which is a range damage, which adds five to my total output of what I could deal to my opponent. Now let's take a look at my opponent's damage output as well. He has a Sneaky, a Zeke, and a Jerry in the front row, all with melee abilities. One, two, three, four possible damage. He has a Jerry in the second row as well, just like this card. He has one melee damage. However, he doesn't get added to the total amount of damage because he's not in that front row capable of dealing melee damage to the characters technically in front of him on the battlefield. So Jerry here is not gonna be able to add his damage to the combat that we're about to have. So my purple team would be taking four damage. The black thief team would be taking five total damage. The way that works is really simple. If I'm the thief player, I'm gonna take five cubes from the stash here, and I'm gonna put them on my front row as in any distribution I want until people are gonna be dead. And what that means is, for example, Sneaky has one heart, so he's gonna take one damage and he will have been considered defeated. Zeke takes two damage and he's defeated, and Jerry takes one damage and he's defeated. The extra one damage is just basically discarded and does not happen to anyone in the back or the middle or back rows. Then me, as the purple player, will do the same thing but take four cubes because my opponent's dealing four damage to me. And again, I have to take that from the front row. In this case, Torment has one heart, Reaper has one heart, and Raisin has one heart. So the four damage is gonna be enough to deal lethal damage to each of those guys. So in this case, both armies did enough damage to wipe out the opponent's front row. If this was the end of the battle, we would remove those cards, and then our units would have the option of falling forward to the front rows. They could move up or they could stay where they are. However, the damage is always gonna to happen to the frontmost row. So if I don't have anyone in this front row and I left scratch here, my opponent is still gonna deal damage to me. Now, before we move on, let me talk a little bit about activated abilities. For example, 
Torment has an activated ability, which you'll see down here by a little box in the left-hand corner. He says, discard one active unit, not this unit, to deal two unblockable damage to the opponent's first row. Now, let's backtrack and presume that we have not had all of this damage like I just showed you and how it was applied. If we're back at the beginning where we've removed our screens and we've shared with each other, here's what we have. From this point, the first player, let's presume that I as the Necromancers had the first player token, the first player gets to activate one ability in his army. And this is where you have to choose very, very wisely. Let's say I saw from what we see on the battlefield right now that I can deal five damage and my opponent can deal four. But I want to find a way to make sure I don't take all that damage. Well, I could use Torment. I could go ahead and put a cube on his square to show that his ability is activated for this turn. Then I would discard a unit that's not this unit, so perhaps I would discard Scratch, and I would deal two unblockable damage to my opponent's first row. That means that my opponent has to immediately take two damage unblockable. And what that means in his first row is he's either killing Zeke with two damage, or he's killing Sneaky and Jerry with two damage, or he's killing Sneaky or Jerry and having Zeke absorb the last damage. It's up to the defender where they put that damage. Now what that means is, if this is what they did, that means Jerry is gone and discarded and now I'm dealing five damage and my opponent is only dealing three damage. So there's a lot of things that are going to happen in Ruckus that give your, your armies are going to give you abilities to have effects. Now on top of that, you're going to be able to chain things together. So for example, when I discarded Scratch, he says reaction. When this unit is discarded, opponents take one unblockable damage. So that means they would have to take another damage. Now you'll notice with Scratch, it didn't say front row, so the opponent could put it in one of his back rows. However, the hugeness of that combination is everyone only has one health left. So he'd have to either kill Zeke or kill somebody else. And this is the way that Ruckus unfolds. You build and plan an army, you then unveil that army, and you start to use abilities that will impact the capability of dealing damage on the battlefield to each other. Now, let's presume that we play this out. Let's presume that this player put that on Bang and he destroyed Bang. Bang says when this unit is discarded, opponents take one unblockable damage. So carrying a bomb is a bad thing in battle, but it's even worse for the people around you. So Bang would go off and my guys would have to take a damage. Maybe I say, you know what, I'm going to put one on, on Fever because he has two health and I don't want to kill anybody else. Then at this point, all of the reactionary things are done from my one major ability from Torment and Scratch being discarded as well. From there, the opponent, uh, since I was first player, my opponent would have the option to use a single ability as well. The only one that he has left on the battlefield is Sneaky, and it says recruit one random card from your discard pile. Well, that could be very beneficial to him. So he could take a cube and put that on there. He now has two cards in his discard pile. He could shuffle those up and get whichever one was randomly chosen, and that person would come back in. Now this is a big thing about Ruckus. Whenever you recruit someone, the recruit is a very big keyword, it goes into the same row that you, the person that recruited them is in. So in this case, Sneaky is in the front row, Jerry would come back into that front row as well. Now as you can imagine, yes, this means that you could break the 3-2-1 rule if you recruited into a row that already had the maximum number of people in it. That is perfectly legal. So in other words, if the thief player was actually going first in this case, and he had uh, Sneaky, Zeke, and Jerry, if he used Sneaky's ability to recruit, he could put a fourth player in that front row as well. Now as I'm sure you can imagine, and as I'm sure you can see, there's a lot of chaos that could ensue. Now once that would be done, we would then go back and calculate our damage. So now I'm doing five, my opponent is back to doing four, even though he lost Jerry, he was able to bring him back. So the first player would deal his damage and we would deal one, two, three, the extra two would be discarded, the back Jerry, the middle Jerry would not take any damage. And then I would take four damage, and again my front row is the one that takes it, so all three of my guys would be destroyed as well. 
Now from here, once damage has been applied, you're going to remove characters from battle. And anything that has reactions are going to be able to trigger. So for example, my guys would all remove their uh, cubes, put them back into the main supply. Torment would be discarded, Reaper would be discarded, and then Raisin has a reaction that says when this unit is discarded, recruit one random unit from any opponent's discard pile for this round. That means I could take Bang directly from my opponent and put him in that front row. Then I also have the option to fall forward. If I want, I can move my units forward. Now I can do so, but I have to still remain with the three, two, one rule. I can't have more than three units in my front row, two units in my middle row, or one unit in my rear row. On the thief side, he's just lost his bang. All of these guys end up dying, and then Jerry moves forward. Now, Jerry says to Reaction, when you play this card, recruit one card. We did not do that in the beginning because I'm dumb and I forgot about it. But essentially what that means is, when you're playing him and revealing him from your screen, you would add more units to the battlefield. That may have actually had a determination on this battle, so I apologize for not doing that. But I think we've given you a really good idea of how Ruckus moves. From here, we would battle again with the characters that are remaining on the board. So winning that first battle in the war is really, really valuable. Now, if everything played out and the Necromancer player won this round, then they would gain this card. And again, the G1000 says when you gain it, you would gain a VP. You would look at the token. In this case, it is a melee token. This allows me, once per turn, I can use one token to add to my army. So if I have this at the end of the game, it's going to be worth victory points. Or if I want, I can add it to a character to add a melee damage to that character. There's going to be several others that have victory points, that have hearts, that have range damage. There's going to be several different things that they could be used for, but the nice thing is they can be used for victory points or to help you throughout the gameplay as the game moves on. And then again, you're going to put this in your discard pile and it says when you draw this card to play it as a unit. So you're going to be able to get that as well. Again, there's five cards in the victory card pile. The next one would come out to be active. The next one would flip over so everyone knew what the next thing was you were playing for. And the nice thing is anybody that's left on the field here at the end of fighting is going to stay on the field for you. So if at the end of this fight, let's say that Jerry was gone and Bang was gone and Fever was up here and he was the last one that survived. We each draw five cards and we're going to play our people down in front of our screens again. I'm only going to be allowed to have five characters, so I may end up with one card in my hand that doesn't get used, and vice versa, I may not want to. There are going to be times throughout the game where you may not want to field all five of the cards that you draw, and you may want to save them for later turns as well. Lots of options, lots of possibilities inside of Ruckus. So that's Ruckus. I personally really enjoyed Ruckus. This is a game that took me by surprise. When I sat down to play my first game, it was a two player game. It took us about 15 to 20 minutes. And it was something that I started to scratch my head about going, is this really gonna be fun with three and four players? And I can tell you confidently, it is ridiculously fun with three or four players. The way the game moves is the beauty inside of the game. You're only going to have so many cards that you get to choose your army from and then have to put them into the right position. And you have to balance, almost like in a war game, what you're going to use for offense and what you're going to use for defense. Because everything happens behind this screen while setting up your army, you don't know what your opponents are bringing to the battlefield. So you could set out five characters with abilities that you feel are going to make you very offensive and help you out in the battle. And then the minute those screens get lifted, your opponent has something that is going to immediately impact you and you have to make an adjustment to. So you have to think when you're putting your army together, how much offense do I want to push forward? How much defensive type abilities do I need? And more importantly, do I have anything on the field that could help me adjust if my opponents do something that's completely unexpected? And I loved that. It felt like if someone took a highly complex army game and simplified it as much as possible and putting it into a really almost portable package to be able to play almost anywhere. The fact that it has a very small footprint is really, really nice. The fact that you can play it two players very strategically is really cool. The fact that when you get into three and four players, there's even more strategies that come into play. For example, in a three and four player game, the way damage gets dealt is whoever has the highest damage output 
deals that damage to every other player. So if we're playing a four player game and I have eight damage and everyone else has less, then I deal eight damage to all three of my opponents. The person who has the next highest damage deals that damage to me and that's it. The third and fourth highest damage don't deal damage to anyone. So when you get into a three and four player game, you get into the strategic movements of, do I have enough to deal the most damage? Do I have enough to deal any damage? And how am I gonna balance that between my opponents? The other really, really cool thing about the way that this game works is the balancing of the factions and the balancing of the gameplay. Let me talk a little bit about the factions first and then the gameplay. From a faction's perspective, each faction feels very different. There's a very small handful of generic type cards that are intermingled between the sets, so you'll see like maybe a Zeke card in two different sets, but each faction feels very different. The Necromancers feel like their activated abilities are doing evil, deadly type magic. The Fighters feel very strong and very powerful and very defensive with all their shields. The Thieves feel very quick but yet very fragile and they have a lot of really cool abilities to do those things. And then of course the Clerics are healing and they're always mitigating damage and moving things around which is really really cool as well. But each faction really walked away giving me that feeling that hey I'm playing the type of theme that the theme is telling me I'm playing. I always worry about that. When you see different factions and you sit down, in this case, let's take the fighters for example. I say to myself, what is a fighter? What do I think a fighter should do? What do I think a fighter statistics should be like? What should I think their abilities should be like? And we all have those kind of stereotypes and archetypes that we bring into games like this. And these all felt very different. When you play the fighters, you have to use different types of strategies than when you play the clerics. I really enjoyed that piece of the game. The other thing is the balance of the gameplay. So you notice when we were showing you some of the cards, some of them had a small black star in the corner. There's three different ways that you can actually set this game up. There is a way that you can pick all of what they call the starting cards, which have those stars on them, and say, this is what we're going to start with. We're going to put everything else that's left over into that draft pile and what you're going to use for your upgrade pile, and then you're going to go. Then there's a way that you can start with a certain number of cards and draft which people from the faction you put into your army based on points, and then you're going to put the rest into that upgrade pile. And then the final one is like this full on crazy, massive combinations of things that can happen draft possibilities. And I really like that because while this game is small in footprint and small in size, it gives you a lot of replayability options. And it gives you options to teach it to new players with a more simplified version and a really elaborate version once you get more experience with the game. And that was really, really cool. So at the end of the day, I have really enjoyed my time with Ruckus and I'm very happy to tell you that we've had a lot of fun playing it, whether it's two, three, or four players. We've had a lot of fun trying all the different strategies of all the different characters. And probably the only last thing that I need to tell you about is that while everything you see here looks really cool, we always want to make sure that everyone understands this is a beta and prototype copy of the game. It's not indicative of the final artwork or the final product, but if it is something that's of interest to you, you can check out all of the things about that at their Kickstarter page. We'll have a link at the end of this video and a link below in the video description so that you can click on it and go directly there. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching. We hope that you enjoyed this critical preview, but let us know your thoughts and questions. Feel free to leave your comments below on the YouTube channel. You can of course join in the discussion on Facebook, Twitter, and Google Plus by searching Crits Happen or at our homepage at CritsHappen.com. But until we see you next time, we hope you enjoy all your necromancer, cleric, fighter, and thieves goblin chaos action inside of ruckus thanks so much for watching keep rolling those dice and we hope they're all crits